welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and usually we have Dotsie Bausch Bausch as my co-host, but today she's actually going to be the guest because she's such an amazing woman that I really pushed for um, for us to to have an interview with Dotsie so you can learn more about her and her journey, which is just so inspiring. So Dotsie, thank you so much for being on the Switch for Good podcast. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, you did. You brought me in kicking and screaming, yes, but I'm here. True. You I'm going to show up. You thank asked, you. so I have to say yes to you every time. <laughs> well, that's because truly I think you are an extraordinary person. And not only are you an amazing athlete, you brought home silver in track cycling team pursuit in the 2012 London Olympics. You also have two gold medals in the Pan American Games. You've, ri- you've broken a world record, and you have eight national cycling championships under your belt. I mean, it's just incredible. And after your cycling career, Dotsie took that big heart of hers, and she started to help. Well, she's probably doing it all along, but you really focused on helping people and animals. Dotsie mentors young women struggling with eating disorders. She has a beautiful TED Talk that everyone should listen to called Olympic Level Compassion. And in 2018, she produced a controversial but very powerful anti-dairy commercial that aired on TV at the Olympic Games closing ceremonies and during the Oscars. Dotsie has most recently taken on another big challenge. She's the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Switch for Good, giving voice to vegan athletes and doctors so they can show the world that a plant-based diet does indeed make you stronger, faster, and healthier. And on a personal level, (laughs) I just want to say that what impresses me so much about you, Dotsie, and like our audience to know, is that you are so driven and type A, but you also have such a big heart. And so for not only as a co-host, it's such an amazing experience to have you on because you're a great partner. And you, when you inv- interview people, you really know the facts. You blow me away with the facts that you know about the benefits of a plant-based diet. And, but you're such a, also a compassionate person, which really is what veganism is all about. And so today, I really did push for Dotsie to be on the show because she's just an amazing person. And I know that you are going to want to know her better and better. So we're going to have to have a part two, Dotsie, Mm -hmm. after this. (laughs) So let's start at the beginning, Dotsie. Tell us a little bit. Where are you from? Well, first of all, thank you for that intro. That was, I've never been intro that way before. And I am... uh, the clamped over here getting all teary eyed with you. But I, I just want to say that, um, uh, meeting you and working with you has, um, been one of the greatest joys of my life. And mm-hmm. I'm very serious when I say that. And I know I've told you before that along the route and the journey of developing switch for good into where it is today and where it might go. Um, doing this podcast with you is what brings me, um, the most delight and where I feel the most grounded in our, in our activism, um, in this nonprofit. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay. Back to you. I grew up in Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah. (laughs) And so were you an athlete when you're as a child, because you're such a phenomenal athlete as an adult? Um, well, no, quite the contrary. I, I, I wasn't, I mean, I love to, um, you know, be outside and, and, and run around and, and I was super active, but mm-hmm. not, not an athlete. I grew up, um, competing in, in uh, saddlebred horseback riding. So wow. I would, uh, you know, say that the horse was the athlete, but I grew up with a competitive spirit and a competitive nature, but an actual, being an actual athlete myself, you know, really strong heart and lungs that, that you need to be a great athlete were not developed in my early years whatsoever. So Kentucky and horse, horse riding horses, how do you feel about yeah, which is, horses now? <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, you know, I, I, I think I feel very much about the industry, the, you know, the horse breeding, the horse racing, the horse riding industry, very much like I feel about, um, like domesticated dogs and cats where we're so far down and we're so deep into what we have done to animals, um, from a domesticated standpoint, uh, that now we're in a situation where we need to 
respect and save them being, let's say, uh, you know, d- dogs and cats. So it's like, I, I have a couple of dogs. I feel like I wish that we had never done that to them in the beginning and let them just be free and on their own and, and, and not use them for specific purposes. Um, I have chihuahuas. They were bred in the 1500s to be emperor's feet warmers in, in, uh, in Spain. So, you know, oh, each right? ca- type wow. of dog and as as a lot of people know which is contrary to what we think many people think today but pit bulls were a uh initially raised in in europe and england specifically to they were called like the nanny dogs right they looked over children so they're they're actually quite docile but humans have done wicked and weird things to them so i i feel the same way about horse racing and, and horse riding I, I i wish that we had never done that to horses they should run wild and free and live their own lives free from you know our ideas that we have for them so um however do i think a horse that's just um maybe retired let's say is going to be more fulfilled just standing in a field staring at the sky and eating grass for its entire life without having any stimulus because they're not free. Mm -hmm. Um, No, Uh, you know, I I think they probably, I I like to think that the horses that that I had um, enjoyed at least the pleasure riding part where we would, you know, we were good friends. I I do think that they loved me and I know I loved them and that we would go out for um, rides in the park a lot of times bareback um, and just enjoy being together, um, sniffing the flowers and, and, and having a bite of the, the grass and drinking some water out of the creek and um, bonding. But do I think it was right that I wore spurs and I had a whip <laughs> and I treated them the way that I did to control them into being a form of competition that I got off on, to be quite, quite frank? No. Mm. it's it's yeah. very it, it, it is, is so it? layered it's the, so the layered bits. i remember when i was a kid we rode too and i would say that bit looks like it's uncomfortable of my course. mother would say no they're fine right <laughs> and now now i won't ride a horse i've turned down jobs yeah. because it had to do with being in a horse so it's really tough but it is it's interesting it's good that we discuss it to, just mm-hmm. to discuss our culture and what we've mm-hmm. done and mm-hmm. and that we move forward and we are moving forward as a species i believe so yeah and you moved forward too you went to villanova college mm-hmm. is that right mm-hmm. and um you were majoring as a in journalism yes when you started you were very excited about this and passionate about being an on-camera news person and i've seen you interview athletes by the way and you do an excellent job but <laughs> you were dis you were disillusioned by the business when you started actually working in the news or new, news and entertainment business in front of the camera. Tell us yeah. a little bit. Yeah, well, I, had, I, ha- I thought I had a real deep desire to um, pursue hard news, you know, just like the, the real nitty-gritty of what goes on every day uh, in, in any city or wherever it might be a- around the world. And I, uh, so that's why I majored in, in, in journalism, and I ended up doing an uh, internship in my senior year uh, and in, in Philadelphia and really was exposed to the reality of how controlled our news is by whatever you want to label it as, the big man behind the curtain, which is big business and big government. Uh, and I, I was just an intern. So, and I wasn't quite exposed to the, uh, inner workings in the meetings of the producers of the station and and exactly why we're going to say no to this story and yes to this story. But Mm -hmm. I knew that I was out in the field on some really interesting stories, uh, really interesting jobs, and they just got killed behind closed doors and they they were never never aired. aired. So uh, that was just really puzzling and upsetting and frustrating. And I realized I don't want to do this. I I don't want to be, you know, just a, you know, shiny, happy face on the camera. That's just, you know, telling part truths and not being able to really share the full story. So, um, at, at that point I wasn't an, an athlete looking back. I think I probably would have enjoyed pursuing sports journalism, but it's like, it didn't even occur to me at the time. It was like, okay, if I can't do hard news, I, to me, the other, the only other thing that was maybe entertainment news. And I was like, well, that's even more fluff than, you know, not even the, the, the real truth behind hard news. And so, uh, that set me on, um, 
a bit of a spiral, quite frankly, because I was getting ready to graduate and I now did not want to pursue what I had majored in. So your identity was completely turned yes. upside down and you felt lost. What happened? How did you cope with this? Not well. Mm. Uh, that was really the, uh, the, the instigator. It was the fire starter to um, my eating disorder and, and my anorexia. Uh, I, I graduated. Uh, I, I had taken out huge loans to go to Villanova University and I knew that I didn't want to go back in t to get a different bachelor's and, and I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do to go pursue further education. And I felt, uh, scared. I felt out of control. I felt, um, just this immense weight on my chest of now you're supposed to go, you know, set the world on fire after graduating. And I had no idea who I was or what I wanted to pursue or who I wanted to be. I was doing some modeling at the time. So I was, I was doing that to um, make money doing some waitressing as well. Uh, and I started controlling my food intake because I felt so afraid and out of control in my life uh, and, and what I was going to become, that that was just a way that I felt like I could assert uh, some kind of order and peace was just start having the control over something. And I knew, well, I do have 100% control over my food intake. I really couldn't think of anything else in my life at that point that I had any control of, over. And I, you know, now that I, I've dug more deeply into it, I recognize, I mean, there's definitely controlling aspects of my personality um, that, you know, I, I've tried to work on and make it be a positive. But anyway, that was, it was, it was definitely a negative use of that side of my personality. And I, uh, but I spiraled quite quickly into a full-blown anorexia because I just pushed really hard every day at controlling, 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 and um, competing with myself basically to eat less and less. And you were, but you were modeling. Do you think that that was why you were, I always wonder why people pick certain ways to deal with pain. Mm -hmm. And some people pick alcohol, some people pick um, gambling, sex, or food, either overeating or undereating. Do you think it was because you were modeling yeah, that you yeah. happened to pick food uh, at that time? Um, no, I, I had started modeling before um, I started struggling with, with anorexia. So it was just something that I was, was doing and was an interesting way to see the world. I'm not very photogenic at all. So it was mostly doing runway stuff. So like a lot of traveling Please. with that too. I don't really know, could there have been something subconsciously that I chose food potentially, but I think I just realized, like I literally woke up one day and, you know, ate breakfast and realized that was the only thing I had control over that morning was what I chose for breakfast. And I realized I had control over my food intake. Take. And I, I, I think it was definitely in my subconscious when I first started controlling it. You know, I, it was, you know, and then you wake up the next day and you're like, I'll just do this. A, a you're like, little. oh, that, that feel, that felt good. I felt pretty yeah. good after I restricted my food. Right. Cause I, it yeah. was like almost a relief because I had controlled something. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know that really modeling had too much to do with it. Um, per se, like one might imagine, right? I mean, I think there, I think there's a lot of people that, that think that that would have um, kind of catapulted it or spurred it on. Um, but quite frankly, and, and, and you know this too, most of the, most models are just complete freaks of nature. Like they're not all dying of anorexia or starving themselves. Well, yeah, there's the few, but most of them, they just came out of the womb, you know, five foot 11, svelte, and that's, you know, they, they all the ones that I were around, really? and this I... is 25 years ago, they ate Really normally. Yeah, they pretended. Yeah, they pretended. Yeah. Okay, they yeah, did. Yeah, I think right. they well, did. I think most of them do. Yeah. Have or they a little bit of a... Some of them might restrict in a healthy manner, like I'm a professional, but most mm -hmm. of the models that... I just heard Kim Alexis actually mm -hmm. in an interview and she talked about how she starved or was always on a diet. Mm -hmm. It might not reach the psychological um, proportions of an, of an eating disorder, but they definitely are have to mm. watch their food yeah i, I okay. feel with the standards that the modeling industry demands of of um women i think really only 12 year olds can attain them before they <laughs> reach puberty Sounds crazy once right. you reach puberty it's very hard um so a lot of people think that well a lot of people think mm, that restricting your food their first instinct is oh i wish i could do that and the second mm. one is that it's all about trying to be thin which is why I asked you about whether it was linked with modeling. And what they don't understand is that it's really about 
the pain inside, it's an mm-hmm. outer manifestation of our inner pain, which mm-hmm. is why I always say to people, mm-hmm. don't ask them about their weight. Ask them about their pain, right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, it, it so well said. I, and I, I think people have a really easy time connecting, um, you know, drug addiction or alcohol addiction or sex addiction, addiction, um, et cetera, et cetera, with potentially someone experiencing and fighting inner pain. But it's very hard for, for people to understand an eating disorder and that that is due to inner pain and that an eating disorder is really just the acting out or the controlling of what is going on deep inside and the pain that's going on deep inside. And I think that's just because, you know, eating is, food is, well, we need it to survive, obviously, but it's just, you know, it's something that's very natural in our society. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we have celebrated around it. We have, we have it at least three times a day. It's just, it just doesn't seem like controlling that would be connected to deep inner pain, but it is, it's just acting out on it in a different way, just like an alcoholic would act out on, um, drinking. So you were doing cocaine at the time too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why do you think you didn't become a cocaine addict, but instead? I, I yeah, guess. that that I will will well. First of all, I will always be very very grateful for because you know there's there you know I, I think that type of chemical addiction obviously changes some of your brain chemistry in the short term, and if you are addicted long enough in the long term, and uh, I just was you know I, I'm maybe one of the lucky ones where I I don't have a, an intensely addictive personality. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it just was something that I was able to do and, well, quite frankly, have a lot of fun with and then stop on my own. Um, so it just the, the chemical nature of it for me, uh, and we talked a little bit about this uh, when we had Chef AJ on and, and the, you know, the, the parts of our brain that react, right, to things like cocaine or methamphetamines or even just sugar, just raw white sugar and that it's a drug. And as you know, cause we've talked about this, you know. there's, that's like, I don't have a sugar addiction. It just, it doesn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, hit, your it receptors, didn't hit your my receptors receptive, in the same yeah. way as it might with, with, with somebody else. It was just something that I, um, I, I definitely used it to fuel the eating disorder. Uh, because it most definitely. tamped down. Your, oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, like it just it's 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 a rock star status for an anorexic, <laughs> which is bad news. But yeah, you just have so much power and radiance. I, I I often feel that an eating disorder in a woman, and it might be with all, is is a way for us to keep our pa- we're afraid of our own power because mm-hmm. it's a way of diminishing ourselves. We get smaller and smaller. Um, anybody looking at you now would be amazed that you were just a shell. Mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. of this at one time for people who don't really understand what it is to be anorexic mm-hmm. can you talk about the life of a person with an eating disorder or the non-life mm. yeah it 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 became in its worst points a uh you know 24 hour 365 days a year 365 how many days are in a year 364 so, five. Five. Okay, I was right. Except for on leave um, year. <laughs> so a moment of like, wait, how many? 66. There you day. go, people. <laughs> um, where there was not a single solitary second of a day that I wasn't completely obsessed or overthinking what was going to go in and what wasn't going to go in my mouth uh, on any given day. And, and at the real height of it, I was not able to to work. I wasn't able to experience life or build friendships or maintain friendships or maintain family um, interactions and experiences. I became afraid to fly home to Kentucky and visit my family because they were the ones that could see through it the most, right? Mm-hmm. And probably recognized it even way before I did. I remember uh, multiple days just never getting out of bed. I was so you know, weak that I couldn't really anyway. Uh, but, um, and, and I remember when it, when I just started hobbling into some awareness that I needed some kind of help in therapy, it would be, I would kind of be in bed and reading a little bit, but I had almost what I remember is just like, no, hardly 
any heightened cognitive function at all. Like I remember reading and I just, I kind of, I didn't, I didn't feel like I didn't know what I had just read and I'd have to go back over it. I mean, it just, just nothing was functioning. I wasn't getting any nutrients. And then I would kind of hobble over to outpatient group therapy and treatment in the afternoon and then kind of like wander back home. It was almost like I was dazed and confused and, and lost and just, I was just, it was, I was definitely a shell of myself. And I remember walking down the streets in, in, in uh, New York city feeling like, uh, I just, I just didn't want anyone to see me anymore. I didn't want anyone to notice my being. And so, uh, and that's, I, I was becoming successful at that. I mean, the smaller I got and the more, um, wrecked I looked right from not feeding myself and not having any nutrients. I mean, my hair was kind of falling out in clumps and my skin was a grayish color and my teeth were, you know, getting a bit gray too. And it just, I mean, I probably looked like I was 80 and I was, you know, 20 to, um, and so it, 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 that it, it, I was successful in that attempt. I mean, there was, nobody was noticing it anymore. And I really liked that. You were in therapy though for, uh, for during this time and it wasn't working or how, how was this yeah, is before it, you moved to California, right? Right. right. Yeah. I, I, I just did, I dabbled in a variety of different kinds of therapy because people that loved me started saying things. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, well, I'll just do this cause then they'll get off my back and I'll say, Oh, I'm, I'm, I go to group every day or whatever, which really I went to group and figured out how to pursue my eating disorder even more fervently. Oh, because you heard other people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We just fed off each other. It was a disaster. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not doing this by asking these questions or what we mean you gave each other secrets on how to. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, and that, by that point, I was starting to, however you want to state it, like transfer my eating disorder from anorexia to bulimia. Mm. And so it was more like how to hide the bulimia, like learning tips of the the trade on that and, and then, and then how to binge and purge more successfully, which sounds like a total oxymoron, but yeah, you well, know as, a, as a bulimic yep. for, for 10 years or so, yeah. I you know. definitely know that all the hiding mm-hmm. and the isolation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I had, uh, I functioned well outside actually, cause I didn't get so sick uh, with anorexia. Um, right. I, I transferred to bulimia pretty quickly uh, and then you can, you can, you, you can, people can't see it because believe me, actually, ultimately your weight will end up going up because it's hard to, um, to keep, you, you still absorb calories when you binge. And mm-hmm. so it, you look like you're healthier than you are. Once again, people sure. judge it by how you look, but really they need to start looking at deeper into your pain instead of just your body weight or what you're eating. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us about when you hit rock bottom. Oh gosh. I, so I, to me, I have like fo- pretty foggy memory of the real rock bottom. I, I definitely feel like I was spiraling into it for a while, but I guess the actual event of rock bottom was when I tried to commit suicide and ran out on the 76 freeway in the middle of the night in, in Philadelphia. Uh, and so it was obviously unsuccessful I, and, and there were cars. I, I it just, yeah. Anyway. Um, and so that was a, that was a turning point. I had a boyfriend at the time and he called my parents and, you know, it, but I, I was already, um, you know, well over 18. So my parents didn't really have a control right over what, uh, over me. <laughs> so I, there, there was so much serious outpouring of love and concern and sadness from them. And I, my mom came into, flew in to, to Philadelphia and I was still very, uh, very much pushing her away and still very angry. And, and I, you know, I, I knew that I had done that, but I still wasn't really ready to recognize that that was a bad thing that I had done that, you know, it's just like, I just don't, you know, I just didn't want to be here anymore. And that would, that I thought was my decision, not hers or anyone else's, but experiencing my mom in such extraordinary pain left a mark on me. And so when she left from that trip, uh, actually in a, uh, in a, in an anger rage, I was in an anger rage and, and took her to the airport and literally threw my 105 pound mother out on the sidewalk. Um, 
to fumble around and get her bags and stand back up and go fly back home to Kentucky. Uh, (laughs) I drove home from the airport and thought, well, maybe I could just give this a go or pretend. I think I remember thinking to myself, pretend to give healing a go because when I die from this, which I'm quite sure I will at least my parents and my sister will know that I tried like that was going to be less painful for them or something. If I ended up dying, that I like, I gave, I gave it a good go, <laughs> good honest try, but that's what I had, had pretty much, um, talked myself into was that, um, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to at least yeah, show them I'm I gonna, tried. Yep. Yeah. So you were in California at the time when you really found someone who mm-hmm. helped you heal Mm -hmm. and so can you tell that story uh i found it really interesting and then i really want to hear about what she specifically did that was different from Mm -hmm. all the other Mm -hmm. uh, places and people you talked to Mm -hmm. yeah so i had been through three or four therapists before that uh before the the one that i found that i'll tell you about uh and i i just always felt very um it felt very clinical it didn't feel like they really cared it felt very judgmental like they were sitting across from me with like their yellow legal pad and a pen just kind of going "Mm, mm -hmm, oh yeah you know that and you're like first of all what are you writing (laughs) you know what are you writing about me why are you writing so much like can you not just sit here and talk to me and you know you're you're a doctor so you should be able to remember some of this stuff and (laughs) take your notes later it just was really frustrating uh and and so none of those ever connected in any way shape or form and and i pretty much after the first couple sessions uh with those former ones i just ended up lying to them i mean Mm. i just would lie my way through therapy just so i could kind of get out of there but this specific uh person um her name is chris edstrom and she spells it k-r-s instead of the other spellings of chris yeah Mm -hmm. no k-r-s oh k-r-s just k-r-s like yeah um and and uh, her last name is edstrom and um she still practices here in, in the Los Angeles area. And I, uh, actually saw a little teeny tiny ad in the back of LA weekly back when there were newspapers, um, that she was going to speak in the, the basement of a bookstore back when there were bookstores. Um, (laughs) <laughs> Goodness, and uh, I just back when there were classifieds, yeah, exactly. All of the yeah. above, <laughs> we're like really dating ourselves now, uh, or I am. And so, I just felt compelled to go. And and what she was speaking on was fear, which is interesting. It's not. It had nothing to do with with eating d- disorder specifically, but um, it just struck a chord. And so I went to listen to her, and the way that she, um, I don't remember at all like what she said, I remember sitting there and how she made me feel so different than anyone else that I had ever seen. And it's not like she was just talking to me and there was probably 50 people there (laughs) listening to this. And so I went up to her afterwards and and asked if she did privates and uh, she said yes. And so we started on our, on our, on my healing journey, like the next week. (laughs) It's interesting you say fear uh, that you had never put fear Mm -hmm. and eating disorder together. I feel like I've heard that everything humans do is to s- try and avoid fear and gain love. And it seems like an mm. eating disorder. I mean, for me, I realize how much fear I have and how I use food to distract me from that fear um, or armor me for to deal with the fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you, do you, mm-hmm. do you mm-hmm. feel like it's, it's, it wasn't fear for you? No, I think it was. And I think that's what's reson That's what resonated, but I didn't realize it at the Mm -hmm. time. You know what I mean? I think that I was, I think I was in fear of everything at that point in my life. And I still have huge bouts of fear. I mean, Mm -hmm. I, I I experienced a really huge bout of it just this weekend. I mean, it's not like it's never, I I think the human condition, right. is like, if you're really trying to pursue something that you're passionate about for some reason, uh, fear can creep in big at at the most inopportune times. And I still really, really struggle with it, you know, and that I, I struggle with fear and I struggle with that, um, imposter syndrome, which we can talk about it being an athlete, but I, 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 I struggle with that now as, as a nonprofit founder, like, what do I know about this? Like this, uh, you know, it, I shouldn't it, be here. I'm an imposter. Absolutely. And people are going to figure it out. Or they're going to mm-hmm. finally figure it out and realize that I actually don't know what I'm doing. And it's like, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, I'm not really hiding that I've never run a nonprofit before, that this is the first foray into this. It's everyone's first. Everyone has a first time yeah, at everything. Right. So it's just, you know, acceptance. But um, that... You, after you went to the Olympics, did you feel you don't feel imposter syndrome anymore about being a professional athlete and a, and a, no, the best. No, but I did it, it all the way up until basically getting the medal. I felt like I had, I wow. had serious all those imposter other championships syndrome. and the yeah. uh, goals. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. It was the, it was the, it was the definitely the biggest situation <laughs> I'll say mental situation that I had to overcome with my sports psychiatrist um, leading into Olympic games. And we, we dealt with all sorts of different things. I, I also struggled from uh, pretty intense nerves and some other things, but mm -hmm. that imposter sy syndrome was, uh, it was a beast mm -hmm. that, that, that followed me all the way to the podium. Yeah. And I guess it still comes up. So what do you do now with your fear and your need to control? How do you deal with it? Well, <laughs> you don't turn to food or restricting. Uh, right. I know that. Right. No, no, it's not. It's not a, a control. I mean, I, it, going back to some of the things that my therapist taught me and why, th why I think that she was so effective with the way that she worked. I mean, she's, she labels herself as a, as a, as a meditative therapist or a meditation therapist, but what that exactly means is, and I'll give just a couple of examples and then how that is plays out now, um, in my life post eating disorder. So in the midst of bulimia, uh, you know, as you know, um, when you are getting ready to start a, an intense binge and purge, um, Chris, what she would have me do is, um, she told me to go out and buy blue dot stickers. Like you would get it like a, a office supply store. And I would go around the house and put the stickers on trigger spots or places in the house that would, um, I would traditionally be when I was going to, uh, go forward and, and involve myself in a binge and purge. And I would do that on just so, a, like the refrigerator. Or the yeah, toilet, the, exactly. Right. The, 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 the door of the bathroom and the toilet handle and the, you know, the, all the places that I would maybe go. So those would be around the house just in general. I would put those stickers on when I was not in a, uh, you know, a, 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 a rough state, let's say. So just on any given whatever day. Uh, and so when I would feel the need to numb out, which was most, most of the time, uh, what I was leaning towards was, um, numbing out with the binge and the purge, I would have to if I saw a blue dot in, in that pathway, which I did because I put them everywhere, uh, I had to stop, locate the area of the pain and anxiousness and misery that I was experiencing in my body, locate exactly where it was, whether it was deep in my gut, whether it was in my chest, whether it was my throat, whether it was my back, whether it was my big toe, to locate where that pain was and sit with it. In the beginning, it was for five seconds. Mm. I, I couldn't, I couldn't be any less than five seconds. Mm. And then I could go ahead with my binge and perch. She gave me complete and open freedom to just go right ahead and do exactly what I had set on to do. And for some reason that just that kind of freedom, which no one had ever said before, right? Every, every conversation, every therapy conversation was about stopping like right now today, mm -hmm. you know, we're, this is how this is going to work. And so that ability to, still be able to do what I wanted to do. Let me have the strength and the ability in the beginning to at least give her those five seconds, which I thought of it at, at that point. It was giving it to her, not giving it to me, which of course it was for me. Like she really didn't need my five seconds, but um, that's how I thought of it. You know what I mean? She's, she's, she's putting this effort into me. I'm going to give her this five seconds of locating the pain. Well, as you can imagine, as we went further and further along, I was able to spend uh, a, a, a significant amount of time with locating the pain and wrapping warmth around the pain, diving deeper into the pain. I mean, it was a whole pro meditative process that I would go through. And at the end of it all, I would have sometimes find myself having sat there for 20 minutes. Mm. And as I moved along, those 20 minutes were enough for me to stand up and go, okay, 
I don't need to binge anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't have that urge. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've been able to, to sit with the pain, unravel the pain, uncover the pain, see the pain, look at the pain in its face and move on from that specific pain in that specific moment. Not that I'm going to have, not going to have another one in this afternoon, but for that moment. And that's all that we needed. And that's all I needed in that first um, steps of, of healing was just right now. We'll worry about this afternoon, this afternoon. We'll just do the right now. So that's, I apply those same tactics um, mm. to today. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a different person and, and they, they, they come on in, in, in different ways. And sometimes I'm not so good at applying them. Sometimes I just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll cry uncontrollably and I, you know, I'll forget to use the, the, the steps and I don't have the blue dots around the house. And I was thinking about that this weekend that maybe it's, you know, blue dot time again, and I can kind of walk through some of this fear, um, you know, in, in, in that, in that similar mechanism that I had used before. So, um, you know, we're work in progress, right? <laughs> we sure are. But it sounds like you, I mean, I know from knowing you that you feel like you have completely healed from your eating disorder. We might have other stuff to work on, right. but, um, <laughs> um, but from, which is huge because I feel like I'm, I don't act out on my eating disorder anymore, but I, I have a little bit of the head of it, mm -hmm. uh, head of an, a person um, with an eating disorder. And you seem to have gone beyond that even more, which is really incredible. Um, how long were you with, how long do you think that healing process came, it took from the, the mm -hmm. lowest point to the point where you really felt free? Mm. Well, from the start of it to when I really felt free was more like six years, mm -hmm. but the, from the lowest point, uh, to freedom was like about two. two. Uh, yeah, it was, um, and, 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 and in the beginning I was meeting with Chris, like, she was coming over like three times a week. Like it was very mm. intensive. And then it, you know, it kind of moved to one, maybe a year in or something, but, um, too long is what it was for sure. <laughs> yeah. Always that, is. Yeah. yeah. Now. So actually it was Chris who inspired you to start cycling. Yeah. <laughs> and so you were about tw what, 20, she gets full how credit. old were you at this time? So when she, I, w I was, uh, I was 24. 25 and a half because uh -huh. I, I, I started I tried my first race at 26 but the period of time be before between I'm sorry her saying you know w this is what happened she she we were kind of venturing towards the end of what I would call my whole journey of, of healing to where I was much 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 better and she she and I were meeting on a much more infrequent basis and I think from the very get-go when she met me she knew there was a you know there was a competitor in there whether whatever that was gonna however that was gonna show itself later in my life she knew that there was a competitor in there and she she also knew that I'd like to be very active and one of the reasons I moved to, to out to California was because it was you know sunny almost every day of the year and I'd like to be outside and be active. So she just said to me, Dotsie, I want you to, uh, you know, I think it's time and, and you're ready to select um, some kind of activity or exercise or even sport that, that you can do that um, feels good to you, that will not connect you to any of your negative behaviors from the past. And by that she meant I definitely had within my anorexia over exercise disorder. And most of that was spent uh, most of that time was spent in the gym on the Stairmaster, the elliptical or the treadmill. And so it was like, okay, those are off the table. What else is an option? Well, I live out in LA and I thought, you know, getting a bike sounds kind of fun because I loved riding my, you know, banana seat bike with the neon flag around my neighborhood growing up in, in, in Kentucky. So I thought that seems like a great pick and I can just ride up and down PCH and along the ocean and up and down the mountains. And that just seems like it'll feel good. Um, so that's, what happened uh, was I got a bike and, and so that she was the whole instigator of that. And, uh, and I just kept doing it and then started getting kind of good at it to where I decided I wanted to try a race. And that was just a really short period of time, like eight or nine months or something before when she said that to when I tried my very first race. And most people who race have been cycling for since they were you know, prof even like with competitively in, since they're teens. So right. you were like a decade behind most of the, the other cyclists, but you, you, you did your first cycling race and then you went and for, for folks who don't know, there's categories of mm -hmm. professional mm -hmm. racing. And mm -hmm. so if the first time mm -hmm. you race, you have to sign up as a cat five, right? Mm -hmm. And you can be 
terrible on the I could sign up as a cat five and then but to get to a cat one which is the most elite cyclist Mm -hmm. is just a it takes a long time but for you it only took a year I mean extraordinarily Mm -hmm. short period of time which Mm -hmm. tell me what was going on in that year yeah, well, it, it, it's, it's, in cycling, there, the, the categories are there mostly for safety because if, you know, you, you really, it takes a, a while to hone the safety skills that right. you need to ride tight in a pack like that. So, um, but, uh, you know, I had, I decided that, like, basically, I, I, it could have been two or three weeks in from riding my bike up and down PCH that I, I had this, like, dream that I was going to become a professional cyclist, which oh, was just that right? totally ridiculous. Cause oh. I mean, I'm literally just coming out of healing and I, you know, but I don't know. It just, and you just got on a bike <laughs> and I just got on a bike, but I just thought this is the life. And you were old for a cyclist. And 26. I was totally old, the whole thing, but it just seemed like that. I just thought that would just be the, the coolest life. So I don't know if ah, it, it okay. was or not. I even remember standing in an elevator once with my cycling gear on and I had my bike um, and I have no idea why I was in an elevator, but I was in an elevator. Maybe I had my cycling gear on and my bike was downstairs um, for me to go get on it. But uh, somebody asked what I did and I said I was a professional cyclist. And <laughs> total lie, like just straight, bold face, like straight face. So I thought, well, that was not cool. I can't. Why are you lying? Like I wanted it so much. I had already told myself that mm. I would become this. So one of the things that I knew that I was missing, uh, basically that my competitors, my my future competitors had that I didn't, was what we call in cycling, a, a, you know, a lot of miles in our legs. I mean, I, I had zero miles in my legs, right? I just basically in comparison. So I lived in Venice. So I thought, well, I'm going to get a job downtown Los Angeles as a bike messenger. And because if I ride from Venice to, to um, downtown LA, that's 25 miles. It's like 23 and a half or something. And I got a ride home. That's almost 50 miles. And then you pick up between 10 and 15 miles as a bike messenger every day. So, you know, we're, we're talking upwards of 60 miles a day. And I do that five days a week. I'm going to get miles in my legs really quick. And, you know, I had been working in art department production for like commercials and music videos and, and was doing really well financially. And so I thought, well, um, I'll just save that money and now I'll go get this job, which I made like $4 and 50 cents an hour or something. It was so ridiculous. Uh, but this is how I'm going to make this happen. So that's what I did. I mean, that, that's really, you did become a professional cyclist. I did. (laughs) I became a bike messenger. I was the only female. There was like, 30 male bike messengers and I was the only female and they were the ones that really helped me um, hone some skills. Those, the skills that I was talking about that you really need to pack. I didn't get, I never got great at it. Um, but I was never known for my skills in the Peloton. I'll just say that. Um, but I got good enough that, you know, my skills, I, you know, I can you hang like in there. Jumping sidewalks. Yeah. And- trying. Yeah, <laughs> going, exactly. Leaving through traffic. Right. So where, so you're a bike messenger. How do you get, uh, tell me, how, how did you get from there to, well, the Olympics and all your <laughs> medals? <laughs> there were a few years in between then. I did take, it was like a 13 year journey, but, um, I tried, uh, I did the California AIDS ride in 98. Uh, and that was when I really realized, um, just that there was some marginal talent under underlying there in my body. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really know, know it before I knew I liked doing it and that, and I don't know why I thought I'd become a professional at it, but I was riding with the front pack on the, um, so AIDS really ride on engine. a mountain bike. A, yeah. There yeah. was an engine there. There was some, there was some, you know, transfer, uh, you know, proper high level transfer of oxygen um from and competitiveness my, and competitiveness for sure because i was on a mountain bike and i suffered like a dog oh, you on a mountain bike oh, on a mountain bike for people who with slicks bike. though with slick tires not okay. knobbies so they did like yeah all right but a mountain there's a big difference between a mountain bike and a road bike right. especially right. when you're right. doing right. the miles right. that one does on an aids ride um right. so wow and you were at the yeah. front pack okay who, for the most part. I mean, yeah. sometimes I would get dropped, but I, I was basically kind of hanging with the guys yeah. at the front. And so the end of that, that, that AIDS ride, I had a, you, you make great friends on a journey like that seven days down the coast, a hundred miles a day camping every night. And so a couple of them, uh, stayed great friends after, and they just really encouraged me to, ch- they said, you should just try a race. I mean, you, you know, there, there is some talent here. This isn't normal. What just, you shouldn't be able to kind of hang with us. And, uh, and so that's what I did. So I, I, I signed up for my first race and then I just kept going. 
And and did you do well in your first race? No, no, it was horrible. Oh. It was just absolutely just the most. I don't know why. Because I didn't of all the the skills needed. For Everything. The it was pour, are... It was it was Sea Otter Classic, mm. and I did the road race, and um, it was pouring down rain. And it was freezing, and every element that is ho- is awful to happen in a bike race was happening during that race. All the weather elements, and then the all, none of us were skilled because, like you said, it was a Cat Five race, mm. um, and so we were all a disaster all over the road. It was muddy. I couldn't see. I was freezing. I was suffering like a dog to even just stay. I remember finishing the race and and going back to the van and calling my mom. And I was like, okay, so that I am never doing that again. We've checked that off. I never mind on the whole professional cyclist thing. (laughs) Cause it was just, you know, but then, you know, just like our, we do it, you know, 20 minutes later, I was like, where's the next race? I got to at least make good on this and then I can quit, but I can't quit after that big of a flail. Cause I, yeah, I was, yeah, I got like last pretty much. Well, you stuck with it, which is, I think, just a, a trait of yours that has is just so admirable, the, the perseverance that you have and the determination. And sometime, sometime during that training that l- ended, up at the, ended, ended up at the Olympics in 2012, you became vegan. Were you already vegetarian? Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. Oh, typical form, you went from probably vegetarian to vegan pretty fast. Is that yeah? I so I, I <laughs> ate meat and dairy for thirty five years. I mean, just d- d- never, never stopped for a single second to okay. think about any of it. And I had been uh, racing. I mean, I did my whole entire road career as eating um, animals and animal products uh, because I. I raced professionally on the road for about 10 years before oh. I switched over to track cycling yeah. in the velodrome. Okay. And so yeah, that that's... whole, yeah, that whole entire time. And it's strange because most people I think would think that you at least, uh, give some kind of attention to your diet because you're an athlete. But I, because I had a history of eating disorder, I was very specific with team nutritionists that I would never again, uh, weigh any food measure any food or count any calories Mm. that everything in the whole wide world nothing was um off the The table as far as what i was gonna i was gonna allow myself to eat so i had this really like super flex chill you know attitude around food Mm. and i didn't want to be regimented with it Mm. and i i knew that nutrients affected output as an athlete like i kind of got that i knew that that was the case but i was succeeding and so i just ate whatever I wanted to eat kind of whenever. I mean, with, with literally pretty much no thought to it whatsoever until I did. <laughs> and then, the, and what, <laughs> what, what caused that change? Um, I just had a experience like uh, so many people have had where I uh, was exposed to uh, what basically goes on behind closed doors every day in animal agriculture. Uh, the, um, the horror, the cruelty, the terror, the, everything that, that um, some of us, some listeners have seen and some haven't, uh, but I was exposed to uh, the, the, the in truth of it. In real life or on the, video? Uh, on, it was actually a, 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 a strange expose that I saw on TV that was in another country. Oh. And I specifically remember that because it was, it was another language. That's how I knew it was another country. But, I remember seeing it and thinking, oh, wow, this is something that I had never thought of. And, and, and is, it's crazy that that goes on there. But I thought that probably does, definitely does not go on in the U.S. Because I thought of it as, you know, the, the government is here to protect the people. And that, of course, must include our food sources. And so none of that must go on behind closed doors um, in, in the United States. So I, I started doing a significant amount of a deep dive and research because I thought, I'm going to prove this wrong. I mean, there, you know, that's awful, but I don't live wherever that is. So, uh, and then uncovered what that, that, it, no, <laughs> that's exactly what goes on here. And so I just had a, um, you know, really for lack of better words, just like a soulful moment where I just looked at that and I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, that's just, that's not okay. And so I'm just not going to pay into that system. I'm not going to support that. Like that's now going to no longer be part of what is going to land on my plate. Cause until I, until that stops, that's not okay. It, it just, you know, I guess even imagining that if that weren't to, weren't to be the case again, that maybe I would eat animals again. And, and of course I don't feel that now, but it was just like that right there, very specifically of how they are, uh, breeding, raising and, um, chaining up 
animals to, uh, you know, I won't go into the details, to, but to, 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 to just die for food that we don't even oh, need. Oh, I see. And these were all sorts of Is farm that, animals. Yeah, there yeah. was, this was specifically um, cows and pigs for oh, whatever reason okay, of what I saw. Okay. So. so did you become, get rid of dairy and all meat? I just then? took all um, animals off my plate mm -hmm. pretty much overnight. Oh. And then as we all, some of us have, you just continue the learning journey. You continue down the rabbit hole is what it is, right? <laughs> as you just, you know, it was just voraciously like researching and trying to understand and read more. And then, uh, so the dairy happened after that um, s more slowly as I kind of started to peel back the layers on what happens behind animal production for animal products, mm -hmm. right? That are not the animal themselves. So first it was the meat and then mm -hmm. slowly was the dairy. Right. Yeah. That's how most people do yep. it, but you probably did it in a much fa faster way. It took me 33 years to go from not eating meat to not eating any um, dairy mm. at all. Well, you were vegetarian so much younger than I was. Yeah. I mean, so much younger. But you, t you do tend to do things faster and <laughs> bigger than most people. <laughs> faster, bigger, stronger. Um, isn't that the, uh, the three <laughs> adjectives you use for switch for good? Um, we do. Yes. We do toy around <laughs> with bigger. that. Stronger, faster, healthier. Yeah. yeah healthier. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so where were you in how long before the Olympics were you, um, did you turn vegan? Um, I one? was a, I was a strict vegetarian with very, very little, little, um, dairy in my diet. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was about two and a half years out. Was what when did this your coaches happened. say? Um, did you have this chill? chill yeah. Coach well, or? I had, I had a, a chill, not chill coach. I had a uh, my track coach was uh, is incredible um, guy that kind of reminds you of like a like a pudgy crocodile Dundee from like the sticks of uh, of of Aussie land, and he just didn't want me to lose what we had built you know so uh -huh, it was kind uh -huh. of like are you really seriously considering making this big of a change this close to making the olympic team like this is so but he but he wasn't he wasn't pushy about it some of the olympic coaches were a little bit more um like from the federation right those coaches were a little bit more like you know you're really screwing things up now like you're gonna lose you know what might be your chance um to go to the olympics because of course at this point the team isn't selected you know we're, we're no. there's still many of us fighting for those spots so nothing's ever ever guaranteed really until the day right because right. you even go to the olympics with alternates i mean so uh, they, they, yeah, they were, they were doubtful. I mean, you know, they had all been trained in kind of traditional, um, sports nutrition and were very much in belief, right. That you, that you needed to eat animals to, um, be strong and to of course get enough protein and all of the things that we know are myths now. And, and what happened to, I mean, did they, they were probably watching you closely and everything that you did that wasn't perfect was probably attributed to you, the fact that you didn't have meat and you didn't <laughs> enough dairy in your diet. Um, did you change physically? Did your performance improve or did it just stay the same? Yeah, it, they didn't, you know, t they didn't really get a chance to uh, poke holes because <laughs> what happened after I made the change was just shy of extraordinary. It was literally almost, it was, it was just, it was kind of magical. I, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't know what was going to happen to my body. I didn't know if they may be right, but I just knew that I was standing for something that was much bigger than myself. And I had this deep feeling that this is what I would pursue. And I would be an activist after I, um, retired from cycling after the Olympics. I just knew that this was so much bigger and so much more important than me going to a well-known sporting event at the end of 2012. Cause I know anything, any, uh, result that you get whether it's in life or in sport or in business, you know, it's, it's fleeting, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it comes and goes and everyone moves on and it's, it's not that big of a deal. I, I you know, at, at the end of the day. So this to me, um, this, this recognition of the truth and my desire to potentially be able to share that on a, a, a larger level, a larger scale was a big deal. And so I just stuck with it and, and I, my performance just, it was crazy. My repair, my recovery, I'm assuming 
that that improved so much of why I was able to output so much more than I was um, eating animals. And 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 the, the the biggest transformation in a number sense, which you know those logic uh, minded people out there like to know, um, I I spent a lot of time on the inverted leg sled because for track cycling we start from a standing start and we're on a fixed gear and so it requires huge glute and hamstring strength. And I was doing um, that about I was pushing about three, 300, 315 pounds, um, times, uh, 60 reps times five sets. And by the end, which was, I stopped on that about six weeks before Olympics, as I began a taper, I was up to almost 600 pounds. So 565 pounds times 60 reps times five sets without any animal products. You'd almost doubled. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And you also were older than your teammates. I, I watched some track cycling. I watched your performance at the Olympics. It was beautiful. <laughs> and so much skill, too, by the way, <laughs> going up and down. The, it, audi- our audience should watch it because it's a really interesting sport. And it's, it's fantastic. It takes yeah. so much power and endurance. When Team uh, Pursuit is done well, I think it's one of the yeah. most beautiful it's poetic mm. but you, we, you can do it very wrong too and then it's not so pretty well, but when I'm it's done sure. well and done right it's 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 really beautiful that, to watch the track is banked really mm-hmm. steeply i don't think yeah. people re- right. realize 44 that, degrees that's a lot really... and you were quite a bit older than your two other teammates it was was that the first year they did it with just three on yeah the, well actually london uh, 2012 was the first time that they put women's team pursuit oh. in the olympic games of course men's team pursuit had been in olympic oh, games for over 20 years oh. uh so yeah so that year <laughs> the men rode four kilometers and the women's event was only three because oh. you know because you wouldn't <laughs> I don't know if we be able to that extra kilometer but very quickly for the next olympic games rio and the and the one coming up in in, in tokyo the the women do the same is this four kilometers and 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 four riders and oh, so when we okay. did three kilometers it was three riders it. it's a different game now with with four kilometers because the way that they have it is four start but you can finish with three oh. so it's very different tactically than when we start in three kilometers we start with three and you have to finish with three mm. So when you're not going to use up a whole person, which is literally what happens, is very different tactically because you yeah. all have to get the line together. Oh, how interesting. Well, uh, folks, look up what's track cycling team pursuit, USA women's team, <laughs> London Olympics 2012. That's what I put in and saw it. It was okay. beautiful. You did an amazing job. Uh, silver for our country. Um, so during the t- all this time, you were pretty much a alone you didn't have a community of plant-based folks where um, a lot of people need that to stay uh, vegan and to develop to become an even right. more a pure vegan um, tell me what happened that you became an activist going so many years just doing it yourself and not being an, an activist I guess you were concentrating so much on yeah being an it was athlete. exactly it just that 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 super laser focused um like professional athlete mind was in full effect those years you know leading into the olympics and i i basically i mean I, we would joke uh, teammates like we barely had time to or felt like we had time or energy to brush our teeth i mean you mm-hmm. just there was just nothing else going on and really basically any given day so i'm glad that that is behind me because it's a it's very self-centric way to live didn't didn't love that aspect to it uh so when i i left London, retired, you know, that day, that evening after the the the, the podium and, and thought um that I wanted to explore this world more and get to know more and 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 meet people and I kind of like I knew that because of the research I had done that there were um organizations that were exposing the truth. Uh, but I just didn't really ever recognize, I wasn't on Instagram yet. I, I wasn't doing much social media on Instagram much, much later. I didn't really realize that there was this whole movement as we know it now, or that it was even the case. You knew it well then. And I just didn't really realize that was all out there. So, um, I 
um, was at home one evening. My husband went to grab us some dinner from Native Foods, and he came home with a pamphlet that was from Mercy for Animals. And he's like, hey, these these people were sitting around a table at Native Foods having like a little chapter meeting. And and I asked him about it because I heard they were talking about, you know, animal, animal rights, whatnot. And uh, so I grabbed the flyer for you, and they were talking about the same stuff you talk about. <laughs> so my poor husband was just the recipient of my, like, flood of this happens and this happens and this happens and this isn't okay. So uh, I uh, called the uh, I called Mercy for Animals and, the, and talk, got to talk to the lovely Ari Solomon, who uh, we, we both, both know, know and, and love, love. Yes. <laughs> so much. And he was like, "Sure, come on, visit. Let, well, I'll take you to lunch and show you the office." And you know, I was like, "Okay." So I drove up to LA, uh, hung out with with Ari. He helped me a lot in um, just. I, I was struggling a lot at the time of being able to. Um, not be sad 24 seven, quite frankly, with what was going on. Like it was really, you know, most of us uh, that are activists in this are fairly empathetic folks. And so I was really um, struggling with learning how to not take on the, the, the pain and, and, ad, and agony that the animals were experiencing. Right. So just, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, Ari helped me a lot with that in, in, um, in learning that I needed to add uh, more humor and more laughter to my life. So to this day, I still try and watch a lot of comedy so I can just have good <laughs> gut belly laughs. But yeah. anyway, I came home, I, I remember buying like teen t 10 or so t-shirts from Mercy for Animals and I drove home on the 405 freeway South. And I just remember being like, you know, well, quite specifically game on, MFers is oh. and not to, but it, I mean I really just felt so in, empowered and emboldened after that that meeting with him and then well dove you in. sure did <laughs> I mean Thank just you, Ari. just <laughs> typical Dotsy style she didn't take long to become from you know just starting to be an uber uber something as a uber athlete and then an uber act activist because you and we've mentioned it on the podcast several times because. It's, such an accomplishment. You produced a anti-dairy commercial directed by an Oscar-winning filmmaker where you recruited athletes from four different countries mm -hmm. to go up against the dairy industry, specifically the dairy industry that is a huge sponsor of the Olympic Games, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm patron of yours in a way, right? As some, yeah. A, a, a partner, it, right, certainly. Right, right. And this anti-dairy commercial aired during the closing ceremonies of the 2018 Olympic Games in Pyongyang mm -hmm. and caused a lot of controversy and friction from, from the Olympic Committee. And then it also aired at the Oscars. Uh, right. Too, right. Right. And so, wow, Dotsie, you just started playing in the big leagues right away. Yeah. Well, I just... I just was so f frustrated by um, the sort of the twisting and the misleading messages that uh, the dairy industry was portraying and pushing via the vehicle of Olympic athletes. It's, it's, it's not, cow's milk is not, well, it's not a food for humans, first of all. So I don't even like to call it a food. It's a, it's a food for, 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 for cows young, baby cows. So it's a material or it's a substance or whatever it might be. And it is not what many Olympic athletes use to produce premium performances. It's not what we need to ingest to be great but that's or what to win milk, medals. And that's what they have you believing. Pushing, Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, like their commercials, you know, nine out of 10 Olympians grew up drinking milk could be very true statement. Um, <laughs> everyone grew up smoking in the 1920s. You know, obviously we... <laughs> We move along and we learn, but that is that that they're perpetuating a belief system that in order to be great at athletics, you needed to have, you know, grew that you needed to grow up drinking cow's milk, which obviously when you say that out loud, sounds like the most ridiculous thing ever when you don't call it milk, but you call it pat cow's milk. Like in order to be an incredible athlete and stand on the podium at Olympic Games, you needed to have drank the breast milk from a cow. Another species. Yeah, right. specifically a cow. Past Not a dog yeah. or a zebra yeah. or an elephant, but from a cow. 
<laughs> I mean, it's insanity. And it just, I, I think it just, it just, for me, it just re- reached its peak when I was watching these commercials as I was watching the Olympic trials in 2018 on NBC and these, these commercials started coming out. And I just felt this need to uh, tell the truth. That's really how the we, we, we put together the, the commercial that aired on the, the, the closing ceremonies of, of 2018 was um, got together seven dairy-free Olympians, some who have six Olympic medals to their name uh, from, like you said, four different countries that were, it was a rally cry to just stand up and say, this is not a health food for humans. We do not need cow's milk to be strong and virile and champions. And that's, it was just really behind it all the way through was truth. What did the Olympic committee do? Did they call you up and say, stop this, Dotsie? <laughs> <laughs> Cease and desist? Uh, that would be nice if they would have picked up the phone, but they um, decided to start sending threatening emails. So those wow. were fun. Um, but, uh, well, but what they, what they did, so it was either, we don't know, it was either the U S Olympic committee or it was the dairy industry, one or the other, or both, uh, when the commercial started airing on the closing ceremonies, it aired twice in Washington, DC, they called NBC and because follow the dollar, they provide NBC with a lot of funding year after year after year. And especially every well, every two years, right? Because because winter and then summer Olympics, uh, NBC didn't flinch and pulled the commercial. So we only aired in in Washington D.C. and we were supposed to air all the way across the country in six markets that entire night. Oh my gosh! So that is why we then NBC did give us our money back, and then we aired. Um, during uh, Oscar week, the next week on ABC. Mm-hmm. But that just, you know, there you go. Shows you the power of, of big business again. Um, and Well, sometimes that kind of controversy can actually help sure. get more uh, eyes on this commercial that's caused so much of a, of a furor. Uh, and now people can see it on the switchforgood.org yeah, page, it I is think. front yeah. and center on the homepage. Yeah, so certainly. So, please yeah. watch it. Yeah. I mean, one of the, Siva Johnson's, never she's been vegan since birth yep and, and she's in our, Osario, yeah. is that, is uh let's see K- K- kendrick ferris ferris uh three-time olympian and olympic weightlifter and wasn't is he, was he so the only one who i mean made the, uh, from team usa yes yeah, in, in 2016 only, yeah he's the only one that qualified um only american and you know no he's huge as you are when you are an olympic weightlifter and yeah. no animal products right. and on his plate that's that's great so after this, you, you <laughs> I'm just laughing because you just, you keep moving forward, Dotsie. So whatever those blue dots helped you with overcoming your fear, just like it, it did Put an amazing job. the blue dots job. back in business. And, and I just, I just think sometimes when I was doing research on, on you and thinking about how, what we were going to talk about, I just really thought, I wonder if Dotsie was really afraid of her power when back then when she was in her twenties and just that fear because you have such power and i'm so grateful that to everybody all the steps you took along the way Mm. to overcome this block this thing the eating disorder that Mm. stopped you from really accessing your power and celebrating all the great things about you and being out there in the world um helping people and animals yeah all of us right we're all we're all just constantly i think throwing um, inhibitors in our own path. Yeah. It, it, why do we do that? It, it's, 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 we all do it, you know, and in cycling terms, it would be throwing tax in the road, right? Mm-hmm. So that your tire flats mm-hmm. and, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I do think it comes down to fear. Mm-hmm. I've seen certainly that in myself. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so t- you started the organization switch for good. You're now the executive director. You're doing amazing things. A lot of people think that I'm somehow one of, um, a, a founder of uh, Switch for Good. You are. We're doing I mean, a podcast you're... together, and I sort of go, I'd, I, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That's a compliment, but I cannot take that credit because it's all Dotsy. No, you you're really a huge fa- piece of who I'm, we are, I'm and everybody piece. on the team. I mean, I'm just like, the, I, you know, I, I'm just a puppet, really, to the team because <laughs> they're they're the, the, the ones that really make this move and thrive and do all of the hard gritty work to figure out where we can best place our energies so that we can do the most good. Well, tell me what you are doing, uh, what Switch for Good does so that our audience can go to switchforgood.org and maybe support the organization. Yeah. Well, so I, I recently have been 
thinking of a, a little bit more like it's almost like a, a PCRM for, for active people. Mm-hmm. It, so not that we're on the left, right? PCRM has been around for like 30 years. But um, I'm saying that because we do a wide variety of different types of activism. Everything from our own independent research study that we're getting ready to start that um, is a pilot study on the difference of dairy. So obviously between vegetarians and vegans looking at blood lipid levels and inflammation markers, which will be, if we think it's going to come out the way we think it's going to come out will be the, the, f- the first of its kind um, in that sense. Um, we do what we call truth tours, which are going around to um, different cities uh, in, in different parts of the country. We've been to Minneapolis, Boulder, Colorado, uh, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Um, and they are uh, evenings of wonderful f- uh, plant-based food and drink and uh, storytelling. We really use the power of storytelling um, to help people start to take baby steps to um, change over th- change over their diet. Um, we're do you, also, do you focus mostly on getting rid of dairy? Or do you also most talk definitely. about meat? You, yeah. you focus on it dairy. comes up, as you can imagine, yeah. like the vegan conversation comes up, but there, it's, it's very focused on uh, the science behind uh, dairy and, and how bad it is for our health and definitely how bad it is for our, our output and our performance and not just performance as an athlete, but just performance in life and, and, and being able to be, um, to wake up and, and, you know, not feeling inflamed and kind of icky and like, you don't want to go mucus-y. on like to, yeah, yeah. mucusy, right? So, uh, I mean- People don't even realize uh, the the statistics are sixty five percent of the world's population either has a severe to mild intolerance uh, to dairy and they cannot digest it properly, right? And you know the 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 white man you know labeled it as lactose intolerance, but but the reality is you know the the white folks we're, we're the ones that first started drinking cow's milk and so over time our system has created a genetic mutation for us to be able it basically does not our body does not turn off that lactase enzyme at age four like it should uh because you know naturally we no longer need our mother's breast milk and so it turns off ours we have a jet- genetic mutation so that it doesn't so we can tolerate uh cow's so milk. we're the abnormal ones. we're the abnormal one right and the normal ones would be m- more um people of african descent or asian descent or uh latino descent that didn't drink cow's milk for many 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 hundreds of years after we started it so they don't have that genetic mutation and we call them intolerant and it's the other way around Mm -hmm. uh that is their bodies are working exactly as they should uh so so it's you know it's a it's a material as i'll refer to again that um is being pushed and fed to um you know underserved communities that is making them very very sick and that's wow. a that's a that's a food justice problem, if you ask me. One of the great things about the organization, you have a lot of videos where you interview athletes, mm-hmm. um, and you really just tear down the myths about the f- that dairy will make you stronger mm-hmm. and better as an athlete. And so, people c- should go to switchgrid.org or the YouTube channel, actually, where we are too, as a podcast. Right? True. Yes. Um, yeah. And see all those great videos. Um, I just think you're amazing, and I'm so Aww. honored to be your partner in this podcast, Aww. but also just really happy that the world has you as a leader in this movement because you're going to make the world just, you're going to help so many people and animals as you go forward in this mm-hmm. uh, in this journey. So thank you. And uh, stay tuned, folks, because I'm going to interview Alexandra <laughs> very soon. <laughs> I get to turn the tables. This has uh, been a little embarrassing, but... <laughs> Oh, so we're all, that's what we're here to do, yeah. right? That's what every activist around the world fighting for any injustice, right? Not just the injustice um, that's happening in our food system. There's so many injustices and, and uh, every day we just take another step forward, right? Towards the truth. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. 
And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.